Hello, this is Daniel Raymond, the voice behind Ray's Guide, and this is the fourth video in a series explaining server meshing from the player's experience. In the first video, I explained client-side object container streaming, server-side object container streaming, and discussed that the two main problems with the current system are absolute dispersal, which is mostly a server problem, and absolute concentration, which is mostly a client problem. And both of those are the reason behind the 50-player server cap that this whole thing is supposed to help us get beyond. In the second video, I discuss shards, their background, their history, what they do, the issues in persistence that they cause, and why we want as few of them as possible while still not be saddling two-thirds of the world with a big lag disadvantage from being too far away from the data center. My estimate is that the equilibrium between those two concerns will be three to five shards, each serving continent-sized regions. But to start with, we may have almost as many shards as we currently have servers. One of the main challenges is getting from having too many shards to just a handful will be getting the necessary performance out of the subject of the third video, the replication layer, which has the task of keeping everybody cross-informed about what everybody else is doing, what they are seeing in the game world around them, and essentially acting as both your computer's and your server's source of what I likened to the big book of game information, which is actually called the Entity Graph Database and getting enough performance out of it will also be essential to reach the goal of just a few regional shards. Now, if you haven't really been following the development of cutting-edge database theory over the last several years, the use of the word graph may be confusing. What sort of a graph are we talking about here? A bar chart, a line chart, a pie chart? Well, m most folks, when you mention the word database to them, they most likely think of a relational database in which data is stored in spreadsheet-like tables with rows and columns, with each row representing an item with identical characteristics and each column representing all of those various characteristics. Now, this is a fine model for a great many uses. I wouldn't dare make an inventory or financial or e-commerce system with anything else. And it's quite possible that most of the back-end databases are still using the relational model. I couldn't see any point of implementing the commodity price system or the pledge system in the game accounts with anything other than a relational model database. But it breaks down when you try to model more diverse collections of objects. The graph database was developed from a prior technology called object-oriented databases. In a graph database, information is modeled as nodes with properties and, most importantly, relationships to other nodes. In a relational model database, those relationships need to be modeled with primary and foreign keys and the relationships divided by a join statement. Try to manage the depth and complexity of objects and the relationships found in modeling a living, breathing universe, and it gets real complicated real fast. So those collections of bubbles on the illustrations in the server meshing presentation are in fact a very accurate way to show a graph database storing information. And yes, it gets complicated too, but it gets complicated in an orderly and understandable manner. Moreover, it makes doing processes which need to do what is called tree walking quite straightforward. Now, you may have noted in the CitizenCon presentation that there were two entity graph databases, one that was inside each shard and another that existed outside of all the shards. What does each one do? Well, the one inside the shard stores everything about the shard and the current state of the contents of things inside the shard. Remember that the nature of shards is a great many things over time will exist or be in a state that only applies to that shard. If a door is open in one shard, doors do not magically open in all the other shards. If a ship is destroyed in one shard, wrecks do not appear in every shard, as that would be able to be used as an exploit. For example, if you were guarding a wreck, those seeking to sidestep you could just log into another shard and take it away. If it was instead duplicated on every shard, the same disabled ship could be looted dozens of times. So if most things that happen in the Vegas shard stay in the Vegas shard, what is that big global entity mesh doing? Well, for one thing, it stores the template version of the verse that a new shard would get as a standard. The second thing that it stores is any of the few things that happened on one shard that does propagate to the other shards. A main example is land claims. And perhaps most importantly, it stores the one thing that can leave one shard and move to another, namely you and everything about you. But this presents some problems. I mentioned some in the video on shards, and now I'm going to get into a more complicated one that is best illustrated with an example. Let's say I'm in my Hercules with a huge load of something valuable, say titanium, with a friend, let's call him Eric, being my co-pilot. I go to the habitation area and log out with Eric still flying the ship. CIG has explained that under such circumstances, the ship is expected to remain in the game until Eric logs out. 
But what if I log back in and deliberately specify that I want to be in a shard, say in a different region, where there is somebody I want to connect to, for example? Do I wake up in my ship? If so, we suddenly have two ships, and also, from an exploit standpoint, two loads of titanium. Or is Eric suddenly snapped from one shard to another without logging out? A situation that could create all sorts of consistency problems as the process for loading a player and all their stuff from one entity graph database to the global and then down to another shard's entity graph database in potentially a distant region is too slow to happen while live. It can reasonably happen only during logout and login. So I've thought a lot about this and came to the conclusion, and I know that you will not like to hear this, that you will need to be shard locked to your current shard until all of your ships are in one form or another of stored state. You can return to your current shard, but not move to another shard because the massive tree of entity nodes attached to you aren't free to be moved to the global entity graph. That may not seem like that big of a limit to you, but if you're an org leader with dozens of org mates flying around your ships, then it can be quite a headache. So as a general rule, the larger your fleet, the harder it will be to relocate to a new shard. It also has the lesson, store your ships. But if your shard lock is cleared, you log out, and everything about you, quite an extensive tree structure, is copied to the global entity graph database, and then when you log into another shard, it is moved back from the global entity database to that individual shard's entity database. Everything about you will disappear from the prior shard and will appear in the new shard. That may be an awkward moment at the destination, but is actually uncommon since the way HABs and hangers are set up. So that's the Entity Graph database. In the next video, I will look at the thing that really is meshed with server meshing, which is the dedicated game servers, or DGS. So now, of course, we're on the Grow the Channel Ship giveaway. As of recording, we are halfway to the subscriber goal and a third of the way to the member goal to release to some lucky player their choice of the Anvil Liberator, the Ship Shipping Ship for shipping your ships, or the Misk Odyssey Long Duration Exploration Carrier. One entry is allowed per video. Members, you're entered automatically. And if the winner is a member as of the publication of the winning video, then you'll win both the Liberator and the Odyssey. For non-members, just be a subscriber and somehow comment using the secret word. And the secret word for this video is the medal that I was carrying in my example Hercules. Fly safe, keep it real, and I'll see you in the verse. This is Daniel Raymond for Ray's Guide.